Hi, today I'll be going through CML or rather is capital market return. So what capital market returns is trying to achieve is to, to find a linkage between the expected return and the standard deviation of a portfolio. Note that it's a portfolio and not a single asset because sometimes people confuse CML with SML. SML relates to the single asset. That's why it's called security market line. So as for CML, we are trying to relate expected return of a portfolio. Let me write as ERP and the standard division of the portfolio. Um, let's begin with a single asset. And um, let me draw the, the, the time and price chart of single asset. This is the price and this is the time. So the single asset may, may experience a, a price movement of something like that. So we have a slight upward bias and um, okay so, so we can see see from the graph that uh, um, is fairly volatile and, and, and the concept of expected return is actually based on the past returns. So for this for this kind of graph, we can simply derive expected return of this single asset as the uh, an average of the historical return. And as for the the standard deviation of this single asset, we can we can derive it derive it by taking the average of the standard deviation of the past um, past x number of days of of uh, returns. Practically, there are different methods of deriving expected return and standard deviation, and this is just one of them. Um, yeah, but this is not the 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 the, the objective of this lesson. This, this lesson is just is to is to is to go through how to arrive at the CML formula. Okay, so as we can see, um, there's there's quite a there's a relationship between expected return and the standard, standard deviation. If we take a look at another asset, let me change to another color. If we take a look at another asset where it experienced such kind of oops, experience such movement. Okay, so we can see that in this for the second asset we have flattish kind of um, returns and um, it's not that volatile okay so so comparing this to a set we can really say that there's there's, there's quite as a relationship between expected return and and standard deviation in that the more standard deviation there are you are expected to to, to derive more returns from a uh, from an asset as compared to uh, uh, another another asset which is flattish, meaning that the standard deviation is small. Um, you don't really expect that much return from the asset. Okay. Um, so so let's let's take an example. Assuming that we are given hundred dollars and we and we are asked to invest in asset one and asset two in any weights that we we want to. What is the expect re expected return of this portfolio? Okay, so assuming that we invest W1 in asset 1, W2 in asset 2, the expected return of this portfolio is given by the weight, weighted returns of each individual asset. Returns of asset 1 plus expected return of asset 2 Oops. okay um, so if you, so if in a more generic manner if there are more assets that you want to invest in it's simply the summation of the expected return of each individual asset Um, let's move on to the weighted 
standard deviation. We some sorry. We can we can square the standard deviation and to arrive at the variance of the portfolio. So sometimes sometimes we use variance and sometimes we use standard deviation um, to express the 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 risk of a portfolio and this can be expressed as the weighted standard deviation of each asset. plus the covariance term. Okay, so so what is this covariance term? This is simply the, the interaction between these two assets. When you hold one asset, it, it, it moves like that. When you hold the other asset, it moves like that. But when you hold both assets together, these two assets may interact with one, with one another. Let me give you an example. So assuming that if you invest in the oil company and you invest in the airline stock, um, when oil is cheap, the airline stocks will, will, will rise typically because um, the cost of the flying the aircraft is lowered. But um, on the other hand, when, when, when oil prices fall, the impact of the oil, oil company is negative and the share price of oil company will fall. So in a way, these two companies, if you hold them together, uh, it's not simply the sum of the of the uh, risk of both the firm. There's this covariance term that we need to take into account. Okay, so in a more generic manner, this can be expressed as summation i sigma i square plus. So this is i. Okay, so in a more generic manner, you can express this this formula when there are more than two assets being invested. Okay, um, so let us move to to the derivation of a CML. Okay, as as mentioned just now, CML seeks to find a co a relationship between the expected return of a portfolio. Okay, which is this that we are we have derived just now and the standard deviation of this portfolio um, okay, let me start off by giving giving you a scenario assuming that we are given say one million dollars to invest in any assets in the world so there are there are hundreds of thousands of stocks that we can invest in and we are supposed to invest the full one hundred one million in all these stocks in any manner that we want to in any way that we want to so so we can choose to say um invest in 10 stocks in equal weight so there's a hundred thousand in, in each stock so we can say okay okay this this portfolio has a has a standard deviation of of here and then a expected return of here Okay, so this is portfolio one. Also, we can choose to do it in another way. You can choose another 10 stocks and then invest it in another manner. Okay, so you can do it here. This is another portfolio. Okay, and so on. And so we have many, many permutations of different stocks. Okay, so let's look at some of the some of the points that we have here. Let's look at say this point versus 
say this point okay um so for this same amount of risk for this same amount of risk question is why should we invest in this weight weighted this group of assets and and not invest in this group of assets with the same risk sigma one there's no reason why anybody would want to want to invest in portfolio one to rather invest in this portfolio okay let's extend this further um, so let's look at this portfolio two versus this one again again um, in a with a similar argument we can say that you know why should anybody invest in portfolio two and not this one because with a similar risk risk profile we can have a higher expected return of in here okay so extrapolating to to all other points we can finally plot plot the the what we call the efficient frontier which is basically all the points all the maximum points that we plotted just now okay so this is what we is commonly term as the efficient frontier which is basically given the sum of money and you have to invest everything all the amounts in that, that you that you have what is the maximum amount of expected return that you can get for any risk profile so you can have a low risk here higher risk here or even a high a very high risk here and for each of these risk profile what is the expected return that you can earn um, with the amount of money that you have assume that you invest everything that you have so this is what we call the efficient frontier of course um just now i mentioned that we have one million dollars of course you can choose not to invest in any risky assets so you decide to keep the full full one million dollars in uh say um in a bank which earns you uh what is commonly known as the risk-free rate okay so risk-free rate we can call it we can put a risk-free rate in this graph because this this axis is basically returns so let's call risk-free rate rf okay so risk-free is the the safest return that you can ever have meaning that you keep you keep cash and you don't invest in any risky assets so this is a risk-free asset um, risk-free return that we have here um, okay so so basically we are trying to find a relationship between the risk-free versus the risky efficient frontier um, by by varying the the rates that we have in the risky assets versus the risk riskless risk-free asset versus the risky assets so we can say we put um, w1 into risk-free and we put w2 into this basket of risky assets what is the return that we expect okay this, this is a question that we want to ask ourselves and and um, and this expected return lies on a line in this graph let's let's start by drawing this line as such so certainly we have we have a point here which is you keep everything in the risk-free asset and if we draw a line like that Okay, does it make sense? We can ask ourselves, does it make sense if if this is the line that links the risk-free assets to the to the risky assets? We should, let's look at this point. Just now we have established that we sh there shouldn't be any any portfolios lying below the efficient frontier. So basically this point, this line is not, not valid actually. And this is certainly not the correct capital market line that we, we should expect so so if we extrapolate this chain of thought the only the only line that works is the line that passed through the tangent of this 
efficient frontier. So this should be the line that oops. So, so this should be the line that that we are we should be interested in. And um, this is what we call the capital market line. Okay, so which actually makes sense because um, we cannot have any line that cuts through this efficient frontier because we we have, some, we have established that there shouldn't be any investment below the investment the efficient frontier. So the only conclusion is this line has to cut through the tangent of the efficient frontier. Okay, so typically. Typically, at the tangency point, most people call this the market portfolio, which earns us an expected return of what is commonly called the expected return of the market. So just imagine that there's this portfolio that allows you to take on the risk of sigma m and earn expected return of e to um, the returns of the market. Um, I can prove the, the capital market line using two methods. Okay, firstly, we let's look at the, the gradient of, of the tangent at this point, um, which is simply um, E R M okay uh, minus R F divide by here. So this is basically the gradient as at this point. Okay, so we are taking the difference between here as the y-axis as the numerator and the sigma m as the denominator. So you can see that this is the gradient gradient at this point. Okay, um, and we want to arrive at the portfolio returns where we vary our weight between the risk-free asset and the risky asset. So let's say we have a portfolio here. Okay. So we call this a sigma p. And we call this a expected return of sigma p. This is at this point we are having holding some risk free asset and we are holding some risky asset. So what is the gradient gradient at this point? This is simply expected return of sigma p minus the risk free asset divided by sigma p. Okay. Um, okay. Correct. So, so we can see that this is a straight line. So these two gradients must be equal. Okay. So let's rearrange this. Okay. By bringing this one over, and uh, bringing the risk-free asset over, so we have expected return of the sigma p equal to um, risk free asset okay, plus sigma p over sigma m into expected return of the market portfolio minus the risk free return 
all right so basically this is the what we call the capital market line let me show you another formula another way to derive the formula so we want to derive the same formula whereby we invest in certain amount of risk-free asset and we invest in certain amount of the market portfolio the realized return of this portfolio can be expressed as rp into the weight of the realized, realized return of the market portfolio plus 1 minus the weight into the market portfolio multiplied by the risk-free portfolio so it's basically, basically the weighted average of the market portfolio and the risk-free portfolio returns we can rewrite this as w into um, rm minus rf plus rf okay so if you want to take the expectation of this whole formula we can express this as rp equals Weight has no expectation, so it's only the expected value of the market portfolio minus risk-free asset. Risk-free asset has no expectation, or, or rather, the expectation of a risk-free asset is basically the risk-free return. Okay, plus the risk-free return. Let's look at the risk of this portfolio. The risk of a risk-free return is zero, so essentially, right, the risk of portfolio is simply only make up of the risk of the market portfolio, which is expressed as follows. Okay, so this implies that the weight can be expressed as. We put this expression into this expression okay and uh, we can it's clear to all that this will work out to be the cml equation Okay, so this is the second proof of the CML equation. Um, yeah, so that's all for now. Oh, hang on. I just want to add one more thing. Just let's look at this this line again. Um, we can demarcate this line into two parts. So we have one one part to the left of the efficient frontier and the other part to the right of the efficient frontier. So to the left to the, of the efficient frontier, we can say that is we. We are varying the weight of the risk-free asset against the market asset because we have established that this efficient frontier is the is the line where we invest in fully in our based on whatever we have. Okay, so so at this point, we have invested everything in the risky assets and holding nothing on the risk-free asset. So question is, what is this line towards the right of the efficient frontier? towards the right of the um, market portfolio so we, we can't be investing more than what we than the money that we have right so what this means at this point is that we are borrowing money to invest in more risky assets okay so that's basically what it means when we extend beyond the efficient frontier all right i think that's all for now in the next lesson i'll go through the concept of the security market line um, which links the individual security returns expected return to the expected return of the market portfolio thank you